come join hand in hand, brave Americans all, and rouse your bold hearts to fair liberty's call. No tyrannous act shall suppress your just claim, or stain with dishonor America's name. Good afternoon and welcome to another Moment with Madison. As a young man, I was a radical. From my teens, I was incensed with the injustice I saw around me. At the College of New Jersey in Princeton, I wrote against and protested their various taxes and other demands put upon us by London. Now, it may seem odd that we should be so upset with the mother country. We had just celebrated a glorious victory in the French and Indian War, where colonial troops had fought alongside of British regulars in protecting our country. Colonel George Washington and Colonel Thomas Gage were friends and fought together at the Battle of Monongahela. Who could imagine that a dozen years hence they would be commanding opposing forces in Boston? So what was it that drove us apart from the mother country? It wasn't just a bit of taxation. Taxes in the colonies were much lower than those in Britain anyway. The founding of America was an exceptional occurrence. Out from the highly structured and authoritarian society of Europe, all these people suddenly found themselves alone on a frontier, left almost entirely to their own devices to build a village, a town, a city, by themselves, for themselves. They had developed highly democratic forms of town governments. They weren't about to let those go. I revered are radical leaders. John Hancock, John Adams, Patrick Henry, John Dickinson, especially John Dickinson. Unlike the others, Dickinson was calm and level-headed. He was intelligent, sincere, and honest to a fault. He was born in 32, the same year as George Washington. Nineteen years older than me, he had inherited significant wealth and own a plantation in Delaware of some thousand acres with 37 slaves to work in. He was also a very successful lawyer in Philadelphia. As Parliament began trying to tax us, he wrote letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania, which were an ex exposition of our rights that we retained as colonies, and he warned us against submitting to the tyrannous acts of Parliament. He then composed the Liberty Song in 1768. It took the country by storm. I and my fellow radicals in Princeton would walk down the street singing it loudly, much to the consternation of the more um, refined elements of society. Now, I told you that the man was honest to a fault. He refused to have a Quaker wedding because he could not commit himself to pacifism in the event of a defensive war. He and Mary had a civil ceremony. When John Adams was pushing so hard for declaration of war, John Dickinson opposed him. He stood the ground and insisted that we try one last time to end the conflict peaceably and return to the bosom of our mother country. Dickinson persisted and he wrote the Olive Branch Petition. To the King's Most Excellent Majesty, we, Your Majesty's most faithful subjects of the colonies of New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, etc., etc., do entreat Your Majesty's gracious attention to this, our humble petition. He didn't even read it. This, of course, filled Adam's sails. We had begged for peace. They had ignored us. Now we were united. Now we fight. Dickinson, however, still tried to slow the rush towards independence. He was unable to convince anyone else, but he himself refused to sign the Declaration of Independence. And as an honest man, he retired from Congress. And as a man who was loyal to his country, he enlisted in the army. At one point, a 45-year-old John Dickinson was serving as a private. He was soon promoted to Brigadier General by one of his friends. <laughs> but, but that's the kind of man he was. That is why we admired him so much. 
I told you that he didn't sign the Declaration of Independence. He was, however, the only member of Congress to manumit his slaves. At the Constitutional Convention, he opposed me on the issue of apportionment for the Senate. I wanted a proportional population, he wanted a two per state, something very beneficial to Delaware. On the 17th of September, 1787, we were signing the engrossed copy of the Constitution. He was at home ill. But he was not going to miss this one. He had his friend George Reed sign the Constitution for him. <laughs> he wrote me a letter at the end of his life. I'd like to read a bit of it to you. Wellington, 1801. Dear friend, accept my hearty's congratulations on thy advancement to the Secretary's office. The late changes open a cheerful prospect to those who love their country, etc., etc. The fervent prayer of thy truly affectionate friend, John Dickinson. I'd like to conclude by singing a bit more of the Liberty Song. Please note that this is the first use of the phrase, by uniting we stand, by dividing we fall, in reference to the colonies, and never forget the essence of government is power, and power's twin sister, whose name is money. Then join hand in hand, brave Americans all. By uniting we stand, by dividing we fall. In so righteous a cause, let us hope to succeed, for heaven approves of each generous deed. In freedom we're born, and in freedom we'll live. Our purses are ready, steady, friends, steady. Not as slaves, but as free men, our money will give. John Dickinson, penman of the revolution. <laughs>